we go ahead and get started? Okay, so welcome everyone. My name is Heather Latimer, I'm the Dean of the College of Education here at uh, San Jose State and really thrilled to be able to kick off our first virtual faculty research seminar uh, uh, symposium. Uh, um, but not the last, and really want to give a huge thank you to Mark Felton, our Faculty Associate Dean of Research, for bringing these opportunities together. You know, especially when we're in this virtual space, having the opportunity to talk about the work that we're doing, and particularly talk about the things that we're excited about, is unfortunately a rare occurrence. And being able to, to bring people together, to share their insights, to share their work, and engage in meaningful conversation is really something that is at the heart of academia and it's at the heart of progress. And so very much appreciate your willingness to, to take on the role of, of getting us together here, Mark. And I'm deeply grateful to our three presenters today, Siley Kulkarni uh, uh, from our Department of Special Education, Tammy Vizentainer and Luis Posa, both from our Department of Teacher Education, who are gonna share their research as part of this, this first group. And you know, I'm excited because they have they each are doing really fascinating research and they also are connected directly to our priorities as a college and, um, and as a university around racial justice, uh, educational equity, uh, um, and our strategic plan that says that we are committed to uh, um, training and preparing the future educators, and, um, therapists, school and community leaders who are gonna do the transformative work that's needed in our schools and in our larger communities. Uh, um, so really I'm, I'm deeply grateful and I hope that as you're listening, to the, pre to the pre presentations and then thinking about questions and conversations for afterward that you'll connect with uh, on that larger strategic goal and the, the four pillars that frame our strategic plan of being community engaged, culturally sustaining, interdisciplinary and holistic. My sense is that you will see those very clearly as uh, elements that run through all of these presentations. Uh, um, and uh, I think that the challenge then for us is to think for ourselves individually, how we further that because our, our strategic plan represents the great that work that we're already doing as a college and also as a challenge to each of us to continue to grow and strengthen that work. So with that, I will turn it over to uh, um, our first presenter. I think Siley is our first presenter, yes? Oh, sorry, Brian's gonna make some announcements about the the logistics here. Thanks, Heather. Just a quick, uh, yeah, quick uh, announcements for all of you who are attending today. So uh, we are recording this event and the recording will be available afterwards on our YouTube channel. Uh, we do have live captioning for this event as well. So if you hover your cursor over the bottom of your Zoom window, you should see the option to open captions if you wanna do that. And those will be available in the recording as well. Uh, those of you who are attending, your video and audio are automatically turned off. So you don't have to worry about being visible in the, the webinar today. Uh, so please use the chat to communicate with one another and with our presenters. If you do that, make sure you select the option that says all panelists and attendees. And then each of our presenters will answer questions after their presentations. And you can select the raise hand option at the bottom of your Zoom window if you'd like to verbally ask a question and we can enable your microphone from there. That's it. Thanks, Brian. And I just wanna also thank our three speakers today for uh, for coming forward and being our uh, our inaugural speakers in, in the uh, Lurie College uh, Symposium Series for this year. Um, as Heather had mentioned, this is the first of several. Uh, we have our speakers here today. We'll also have speakers coming in two weeks. Uh, that will be Eduardo Munoz Munoz and Rebecca Bersiaga. Um, and um, the idea of these talks is really to invite faculty to share the work that we're doing so that, that we here in the Lurie College and beyond um, are aware of each other's work and 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 to ways and it's a way to explore connections with each other um, and with future projects. Uh, I'm going to keep my comments very very short. I'll just introduce each speaker. At the end of each speaker's talk, we're going to spend about five or ten minutes taking uh, questions and answers um, for for each of the speakers. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Sally Kilkerney, an assistant professor from the Department of Special Education. Sally, thank you. We go to the next slide, I think. Oh, one more. There we go. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you to Dean Latimer, to Mark Felton, and um, I'm just really, really excited to be here to share this work. 
Um, this is a new piece of work that I have currently undertaken. Um, and so, yes, I'm really just excited to share some of this with you. Um, as everyone said, I'm Sylee Kulkarni. I'm an assistant professor of special education. And this work really looks at disability studies, critical race theory at the margins of teacher education. And so if you see from the photo here um, in this title slide, um, you'll have a you know kind of cliff with um, some jagged edges. And you know, I kind of see you know this work, the work that I'm going to be presenting is sort of on the edge, right? It's right on the margins or on the edge of teacher education. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit more about what that means, but that's that's sort of the representation there. Um, next slide. So for those who are not familiar with disability studies critical race theory, I just briefly wanted to mention um, Anima et al. 2013, um, which is the seminal piece um, in race, ethnicity, and education that talks about this framework. Um, and this framework, the, the sort of central um, idea behind the framework is to look at how racism and ableism are interdependent. Um, identities and the, the ways that they operate in schools and in um, other fields. Um, so it's not limited to education, but for you know my context, I studied it in education. But um, just as seven tenets, and um, these tenets again are, are you know sort of broadly about the intersections of racism and ableism. And a couple of these you know are, are sort of more you know sort of prevalent in some of the work that I'm doing in teacher education. Um, for instance. Tenant three, that you'll see in the purple, um, emphasizes the social constructions of race and ability and the psychological impacts of a label or language. And so if we think about schools and the ways in which students are positioned or labeled, right, that there are some, some direct and indirect impacts of those labels. And so, um, you know, some of my work is really looking at that um, in addition to tenant four, which is privileging voices of marginalized or what we say is multiply marginalized populations. Um, so students of color with disabilities in particular. Um, next slide, please. And so I just wanted to point out a little bit um, of language that I'll be using in this presentation. Um, so uh, Erica Miners, 2013, uses what's called the school to prison nexus. Um, you may have heard of the school to prison pipeline, but the nexus is really an idea that uh, brings out this idea of the web of punitive threads, right? So it's not necessarily a linear process in which students go through school and then, you know, end up in you know incarceration or juvenile detention centers, um, you know through some of these sort of punitive experiences through schools that students may end up there, right? Um, and that's not a linear process. It's, it is a web of what is called punitive threads. Um, I also wanted to bring up this point, which is um, this idea of color evasiveness. So we talk about um, this idea of color blindness. Um, and, you know, Anima et al. 2017 expands this notion and, you know, uh, Neil Gotanda's work of colorblindness. Um, but one of the ways in which I've sort of taken up or used this work um, is really thinking about sort of the disability metaphor of this work, right? So blindness is often talked about. We talk about blind spots or I'm blind to that, right? And that metaphor for weakness or undesirability that is often linked with disability. And so in my work, right, I'm trying to avoid some of those more ableist terms or ableist language. And I have, you know, a resource here, which, you know, I can turn back to if people have questions about that after. Uh, next slide, please. So I can give you a couple of examples of how racism and ableism are operating interdependently in schools, um, some of which you may have heard of before and some of which may you know, not be as familiar. The first is obviously overrepresentation or disproportionality in the field. So the overrepresentation of students of color, most typically in high incidence disability categories, such as emotional behavioral disturbance, learning disabilities, specific learning disabilities. Um, so these students are typically overrepresented in special education programs. Um, so they're over identified and overrepresented. And oftentimes these are black and brown students who are overrepresented. 
I also, you know, we can note racism and ableism in this area of discipline disparity. So kind of what I was talking about before with the school to prison nexus, there are discipline disparities for students of color and especially students of color with disabilities. Um, oftentimes, you know, our address of behavior and management, quote unquote, of behavior in classrooms um, is, you know, fraught with problems, especially for students we, you know, deem outside of the norm or, out, or undesirable. Um, the third is that students, um, special, excuse me, special education teachers of color are often positioned in our teacher education programs in research and in schools as less than. And so, you know, some of my recent work has looked at, you know, how we can reposition these teachers as knowledgeable and learn from their experiences um, as teachers of color, as sometimes teachers of color with disabilities, and really sort of start to reframe the way that we think about teachers of color. They, and then there's also, you know, in special education, this issue of service and support disparities. And so some of my recent work um, on augmentative alternative communication systems really looked at how we aren't talking about race and disability together. And especially when we're thinking about, um, you know, language supports and interventions and service providers, um, you know, race tends to be ignored or invisible. And then finally, this idea of color evasiveness. So, you know, this idea of disability as an immutable fact. And so, you know, this sort of is a tension, right, within the field, because we do know that disabilities exist, right, that there are some identifiable characteristics and, and identities of disability. But we also know that some of these um, are very, you know, subjective and sort of uh, a little bit less easy to sort of identify. And so those tensions are, are part of what this, this talk will address. Um, next slide, please. And so the purpose of the, the study that my colleagues and I worked on recently is to look at multiply marginalized students um, and especially students with complex or extensive support needs, because these are the students that are rendered virtually invisible. So these are students not seen as human. They are de-raised, they're de-gendered, they're de-sexualized in schools. And so what does a framework like Discrit afford these multiply marginalized students, these students who have more complex or what we you know, call in the field extensive support needs? And then I'm also looking at what can we think about in terms of a disparate informed curriculum and, and you know, how does that kind of play into those margins that I talked about before. Next slide, please. And so I start with this. This is um, a poem by Latif McLeod. He is a disabled person of color. He has complex support needs and he is also an activist in the disabled community. And um, I won't read the entire poem for you, but I'll read maybe the first two stanzas because I think they really sort of capture some of what I'm talking about here. Um, so the poem is called, I am too pretty for some ugly laws. I am not supposed to be here in this body here speaking to you. My mere presence of erratic moving limbs and drooling smile used to be scrubbed off the public pavement. Ugly laws used to be on many US city law books, beginning in San Francisco in 1867, stating that any person who is diseased, maimed, mutilated, or in any way disformed so as to be an unsightly or disgusting object or an improper person to be allowed in or on the streets, highways, thoroughfares, or public places. And so if we look at you know, this poem, right, the laws, and the way that this person is kind of, you know, describing the ways in which we think about complex support needs and extensive support needs, it becomes pretty apparent, right? Um, the ways that we, you know, have treated disability, especially this kind of low incidence disability. Um, and so um, I'll go to the next slide, please. And so for students with complex support needs, our traditional law knowledge base of that has been grounded in special education and has been limited by positive, positivist, excuse me, ways of knowing. Um, even when we think about things like inclusion or inclusive education, the focus is really more on technical implementation. And so when we're thinking about technical implementation, we're saying, oh, well, that child is in the classroom, that child is in general education, then everything is fine. And really we have to think about the fact that it doesn't stop there, right? 
there is still ableism in that classroom. There is still racism in that classroom. And that classroom is thought of as the ideal place for all students, right? But that classroom still relies on dominant normative structures of schooling, which are problematic. So um, it, it doesn't stop with inclusion. There's also critical silences in social justice traditions. There's not necessarily a home for disability. So when we talk about social justice, when we talk about things like critical race theory, there wasn't a home for disability and especially students with complex support needs. Um, and so Nussbaum 2019 notes, there's an explicit absence of disability from these educational dialogues. It's akin to an ontological erasure of disability body minds. And so we, you know, we're thinking both about disabilities in terms of people's physical disablement, but also about mental disabilities and mental health in these ways. Next slide, please. And what we notice, right, with disability is that there is a hierarchy. Right? There's hierarchies among these disability categories that have been constructed, right? Where the focus when we think about things like race, culture, language is always on those high incidence labels, such as learning disabilities. That's not to say that there are inequities that exist with these labels. We know that there are, but there is a lack of attention to low incidence disabilities. So students with Down syndrome, students with more intellectual disabilities, students with complex needs. These are the disabilities that are invisible, de-raced, de-gendered, de-sexualized. And so this argument needs to be made for an embodiment of an intersectional understanding of the lived realities of these folks with disabilities, these folks with complex support needs. Next slide, please. And so what can discrete afford students with complex support needs? And so, you know, you can think about some possibilities without necessarily coming up with the answer or the, you know, practice, right? So the idea is to expand some of those tenets of discrete and really think about what are those lived experiences of students who, like Latif McLeod, right? identify with support needs that are complex, who identify as multiply marginalized. How do we rehumanize students who have been rendered less than human? How do we think about and accept um, and promote, right, these students who have been erased in educational research and practice? Next slide, please. So what can then a discrete informed curriculum look like, right, for teacher education, for, you know, most of us who are here in, you know, some form of education, mostly teacher education, we can look at both the historic and current practices that are used, that including such things as redlining, legal decisions, um, again, the implications of race, disability, and deficit for these different systems, right? So school systems as a whole, but also for discipline, exclusion, and erasure. Next slide, please. And so some of the implications for a discrete cur informed curriculum, if we're thinking about um, P-12 students, right? Um, Baglieri and Lelvani 2020 have wrote, written a, an amazing book um, about undoing ableism in the K-12 system. So how do we explicitly teach about intersectional identities in classrooms, including disability and including ableism? So how can these become topics that are part of our curriculum? How can we also build collaborative resistance so that students are part of this, so that teachers are part of this, and so that communities are part of this? And how do we emphasize the importance of both our current realities for people of color with disabilities, and then also those historical moments that have led us here? So again, this is drawing a lot on the um, labors of activists, disabled people of color, who have been doing this work for such a long time. Next. Um, and so for teachers, how do we counter the persistent invisibility of disability, especially in teacher education? And how do we move beyond thinking about what are called like CLD frameworks? Oh, so let's just look at culturally, linguistically diverse learners, right? How do we move beyond that framework to actually looking at the lived realities of multiply marginalized youth and their communities? How do we dismantle the existing curriculum which oppresses marginalized youth? And how do we draw from curriculum that's already been doing this work, that's been negotiating and bridging the intersections of disability and race? Next slide, please. For teacher education, we have to think about shifting power and agency among stakeholders. We have to think about 
And when I say immediate needs, I don't mean like, oh, we have to think about one or two practices that are going to work in the classroom. I'm thinking about what are the needs of the community, right? What are the needs of students that we can draw on in our curriculum, in our programming? How do we break down those existing teacher education structures, which have, you know, ne never really thought about disability or never really brought disability to the forefront. And so we have to think about these in conjunction with some of our things like gatekeeping mechanisms. So, you know, our admissions testing, our financial costs, our hidden curriculum, right? Some of those things that are gatekeeping. But we also have to recognize that special education, teacher education, and disability study, all of these fields hold constraints, especially for students with complex communication and complex support needs, right? So disability studies has often been criticized as being too white. There's a whole hashtag, disability too white, right? And how does, you know, that as well as, you know, special education and teacher education, how do we, you know, move beyond these constraints to actually uplift or hold, you know, disability as an existing identity that is intersectional? Um, next slide, please. And so I offer, you know, a couple of concluding thoughts and possibilities, again, without answers, right? This is for us to kind of begin to build or to think about some of this work. And so, you know, I go back to disability studies, critical race theory with these questions of, you know, who matters, who is valued and why do we fight, right? So by asking these questions, we, you know, we can start to build some of those answers. And so um, I draw from this really great quote by Lee Patel, um, Dr. Lee Patel, who says, we are the ones we've been waiting for. Um, and so we are the ones we've been waiting for to foster visibilization, epistemological complexity for students who have complex or extensive support needs for all disability labels, for all of the folks who are multiply marginalized. Um, and I will end there. Thank you. Thanks, Siley, for uh, opening up this dialogue. And I really appreciate you framing um, your, uh, some of these questions as questions um, to, to really allow people to sit with them and to think about some solutions. So I'd like to make some space here for, for uh, our participants today to, to ask questions. So if you have any questions, just raise your hand and um, Brian can unmute you so that you can ask your questions. And while people formulate their questions, maybe I'll start, um, Sally. So I really appreciate this um, idea of um, critical silence. And I think it's a very real thing. And oftentimes when I think about what we try to do in terms of teacher preparation, it's like preparing somebody for a situation where they're gonna step into and just discover a silence. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering if you have any maybe examples of situations where space was being made in schools for practicing uh, uh, special education teachers and general education teachers to have these kinds of dialogues. Because I think without that kind of space, we're not making room for people get so busy with work and then we're not creating room for people to critically unpack assumptions that they bring into the classroom. So do you have any examples of places where um, space was made for these kinds of dialogue? Yeah, and actually, I mean, I can comment on a space that we're trying to create right now, which I'm really excited about. Um, we recently received um, an AERA Division K grants, um, which is doing exactly this for teacher education. So we are um, bringing in community scholars who are disabled folks of color. We are, you know, putting them in engagement sessions with our teachers in special education and in general ed um, across the country. So not just San Jose, but San Jose is one of the, the sites. Um, and we're doing this all virtually. So we are setting up sessions where teachers begin to kind of unpack or learn about ableism, yeah. because I think even in special education, we're not talking about ableism explicitly. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, trying to create these spaces um, in our teacher education frameworks. There are schools also that are doing this. So, I, you know, I'm not the only person who's done this before. There are, set, you know, set up um, seminars for you know teachers and then also for students that are being created in classroom spaces um, and a lot of this I think is you know the idea of bridging community spaces with teacher teaching spaces right so like we know that people have been doing this work we know that the community activists and community scholars have been doing this work for some time how do we bring them together with our teachers with our students um, to really create this open you know space of dialogue 
Thank you. I'm seeing lots of comments of support and thanks uh, in the chat. I don't know if you're observing the chat right now, but um, so uh, any other questions from our webinar participants? I think there's a question mark from Laura in the chat as about a substitute from the perspective of a substitute teacher. I am asked to fill in for a special education teacher who has abruptly quit. What changes can we make to the classroom to support these teachers? So people who are who are coming in into a classroom environment that's already been created. Yeah, um, that is a really tough question because yeah, they've already kind of walked into a structure, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, even if you do walk into a structure, right, you can start to make little changes or you can start to like, uh, you know, take some initiatives, right, to kind of make these changes. So, you know, even if you're walking into an existing structure, you can start maybe by asking those questions. Well, you know, like, why is this set up like this, right? So if you're a substitute mm -hmm. teacher, maybe asking around the school, like, you know, uh, you know, do, is there a rationale, right, for a particular practice being used in this particular way? And to start to maybe, you know, dialogue with other teachers about why, and then, you know, from there, maybe go into making some of those small changes. Yeah, but it does beg the question, what are ways in which we can, can rethink the structures uh, mm -hmm. of schools so that right. we're not trying to deal with this piecemeal uh, teacher by teacher. We've got time for one more question. And now I'm reading the chat more carefully because I missed that question before. So I'll ask a question that kind of ties to the, the comment that Rebecca put into the, the chat around the need to talk about this with leadership as well as obviously, you know, you're doing this work and advocacy with our students who are becoming beginning teachers. Um, and that's critical and important. And my fear is always we're putting them out there and expecting them to make this massive change when they themselves are often vulnerable as new teachers, new educators in the system. So how, how do we provide spaces to do the yes and? Yes, we need to prepare our beginning teachers and we need to do the work that is uh, um, structural and working with leadership as well. And both uh, positioning our, our students and giving them the tools to, to go into power dynamic conversations, uh, um, but also we need to do that advocacy and work in addition and not expect our students to take that all on themselves. Right, yeah, and I think that's part of the, the progress, right, like is to think about, you know, how can we bring the leadership spaces and the teaching spaces together, and I know, you know, we have our new uh, program, right, in ed leadership, and I think, you know, those are the opportunities, right, to bring in some of the um, critical work around like disability and intersectionality and multiply marginalized youth, right, to the table for not just for our teachers, which, which is important, but also for our leaders. And so that everybody's sort of getting, you know, the same types of information, understanding, you know, the intersections of racism and ableism in schools. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's part of the challenge, right? If we teach, you know, the teachers, but we don't necessarily engage leadership, they're still kind of bound to the structures that leadership has sort of put in place. Yeah. So I think it, it does, you know, make it so that we need to kind of collaborate or we need to bring together everybody. I think that the last response actually also responded to a question from David Whitenack in the chat where he asked, um, how can you envision working with school leader? How can we envision working with school leadership, uh, for example, principals to create the spaces that will allow gen ed and special education teachers to collaborate? I think, yeah, I think you sort of answered that. It's a, it's a huge piece of making this work, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think in you know the university setting, we have to do it, but we also have to do it in the schools, right? We have to start having these conversations so that when PD is happening, right, it's not just PD for the teachers or it's not just PD for the paraprofessionals, right? It's PD for everybody. Um, how can we bring you know all of our stakeholders together to do things together so that it's not you know this person gets this, this person gets this piecemeal, yeah. So thank you, Sally, um, so much for this, this moment. And for this, uh, if you have further questions uh, for, for Sally Kulkarni, please feel free to drop those into the chat. Maybe if we have a, a time at the very end of today's session, we can um, return to this. Uh, but in the meantime, I'd like to make a transition here uh, to uh, 
Tammy Visentiner, an assistant professor in the Department of Teacher Education. Tammy, on to you. Hi. Um, thanks, Eileen. That was awesome. And uh, I'm excited to talk more with you about your work after this. Um, thank you to everyone who's helped organize this. And um, I'm excited to kind of share some of the things I've been doing. You can go on to the next slide. And yeah, the next slide. Sorry. Um, so I guess I just want to, before we start, I want to take a moment to acknowledge this, this place we find ourselves, um, this an unprecedented time we find ourselves and to, oh wait, go back to the, sorry, did I say next slide? Yeah, this one. Um, and acknowledge my position in, as a white faculty member in this institution, also the colonizing histories of institutions of higher education, uh, who they were built by and for, and who they were actually never intended to serve. Um, my professional pathway has been built from a foundation of black brilliance and mentorship of scholars of color. Um, and it's really shapes my trajectory and why I do the work I do and what I do. And I really see this as an opportunity to reimagine um, we, we, there's a lot of evidence and you all know that, um, what was normal wasn't equitable for, for many and most of our students. Um, and so how do we really reimagine, take this time to reimagine what teaching and learning can be, uh, and, and to make that a reality. And so I really like this image of, um, sort of also the historical kind of context of, you know, the statue that is at the center of our campus and what it symbolized in 1968 and what it still symbolizes now and the work that has been done um, and the work that we need to continue moving forward. Uh, next slide. This is also kind of a call to action in the stance with which I take, you know, to kind of conduct my research and my teaching. But seeing that students, especially those from racial groups historically and currently marginalized in society, school, and in my case, science, um, are in crisis and in, in institutions of higher education as well. Um, I'm someone who studies racialized narratives and intersections of people's identities. And we are at a time when societal narratives about who belongs here, who is valued, who, what is true, in the terms of like the intentional blurring of facts and fake news, um, and there's, these narratives have always been in circulation, um, but they have gained a particular power and salience in our contemporary societal discourse. Um, and this really matters for what, whatever subject we're teaching across all of our university. If it's chemistry 101, or if it's English language arts, it matters. And so I think we need to think really deeply about the, the position our students um, and the students they're teaching are in right now. Um, and I also see scientific and STEM literacy as a fundamental human right. And so how do we really empower? Um, my goal is to empower teachers, to empower students to have those tools. Um, next slide. And then I just wanna take a brief moment to talk about inspirations for my work. I was at a um, conference in 2019 in the spring and happened to see the key closing keynote ad address of Nicole Hannah-Jones. For those who don't know who she is, she's um, a scholar and journalist with the New York Times. Um, she's responsible for the 1619 Project and other really amazing, incredible work. Um, and this was the first slide she showed at her, at her closing keynote. And I've thought about this probably every day since. Um, so it says, we have, we have the solution, we just refuse to do it. Um, and in this slide, or in, this, in her keynote, she was talking about a racially resegregated and unjust education system, arguing that schools are not broken, they're operating as designed. And this is an argument made by, by people in, in different fields also. Um, and so I come back to this a lot because her stark critique of a system that has been designed to be intentional, um, inten designed intentionally to be inequitable, is impossible really to reconcile. Um, and so I think if we designed it intentionally to be inequitable, then we need to redesign it to be what it needs to be. Um, next slide. I've also spent a lot of time talking to young people um, through my dissertation work and my research still today. And it's where I get my inspiration and understanding. And my goal, especially as a white faculty member, is to really try to understand 
where are young people of color coming from? What are their dreams and goals? And, and how do I better support um, them and or educators to support them? Um, and so one of the conversations I had while I was conducting my dissertation research was with Melanie. Um, she was a rising 10th grader. She was super excited about science. It was her favorite subject in school. Um, but she also expressed a um, lack of access to high quality science instruction. Um, and when I asked her how, how she envisioned scientists, she said, I think of them in white gowns, clipboards and really high tech equipment and computers and like people with glasses and goggles and stuff. And then we talked about like science textbooks and where does that come, where does the knowledge in those textbooks come from? And she said, well, I think scientists write it because they have the power to do that. And I said, well, what do you think makes scientists powerful? powerful? And she said that they're labeled scientists and that, that makes them smarter than everyone. Um, and then we also discussed um, intersections of race, class, and positioning. She was a Filipina student and she said, I've never heard of a professional Filipina scientist. Maybe it's just a lot of other races don't feel comfortable. Here it's a lot of low income or working class people and they probably don't feel like they're good enough to become scientists because it's like high. So the combination of the, these kinds of, the, the experience of Melanie is, is, I wouldn't say representative necessarily because I think all students have obviously their, their own experiences, but um, these ideas about power and status and um, the things students are picking up about scientists have really shaped my work with teacher educator, uh, as a teacher educator and my work with science teachers. Um, next slide. So these, there's a lot of issues of equity in science education. My focus is on racial underrepresentation or groups that are historically and currently marginalized in society, school, and in science. Um, I see that both as broadening ideas and opportunities to engage in authentic science. So what science is, a lot of times we think of chemicals and equations and all kinds of like lab coats. And while that's not dissing anyone in chemistry or anyone who wears a lab coat, there, that is part of science, but there's a lot else that is also part of science. And how do we engage kids meaningfully in that? And then also who can do science? So opportunities to see oneself as a capable science learner. There's dominant narratives about who scientists are. How do we expand that and allow opportunities for, for students to author their own identities in science? And then I see these two things as connected by notions of identity. And I explore specifically how students' science and racial identities and other intersectional identities take shape together um, in science learning environments. Um, next slide. I realize I am not paying attention to time very well and I probably should speed up. Um, so this is a little bit busy, stick with me here, um, but this is sort of the overall, I take a critical sociocultural and ecological approach to race identity and learning in science education. And just to kind of talk through this really quickly, if you think about educators and scientists sort of at the center, thinking of these arrows kind of represent all of like race and racialized narratives that are operating throughout these systems and things that position students and educators. Um, and these are the different layers. I mean, there's also all kinds of layers that are not here, but they're intersecting and interconnected. And so I really build off of Bruffenbrenner's ecological theory, but then really layer on doctors, um, Carol Lee and Dorothy Roberts, who really take a more critical approach to the, to the layers and to thinking about race and how it, it reverberates through this entire system. Um, and so when I think about educators, I think about developing this critical vision. I'm gonna, the next slide focuses more on that, but don't go to the next slide yet, sorry. Um, and when I think about students, I think about learning and identity construction happening together. This builds directly off of uh, Nayla Nasir. She was a great mentor of mine, is a great mentor of mine. Um, that they're distinct processes, but they're happening together in, in social contexts. And then I think about, again, these arrows, what kind of positioning work is happening throughout the layers of the system? societal narratives, um, interactions in classrooms, um, and how do we take that into account when we're preparing teachers? Um, next slide. And then this has sort of been this emerging thing that I'm still sort of sorting out. I presented it to some folks, but um, this idea of a critically and racially conscious pedagogical vision. So again, as a white faculty member, I've gone through this incredible and forever learning process, right? I've had amazing mentors and I will always be a learner. And how do I sort of engage teacher candidates, many who look like me, 
um, in this work of really understanding and expanding how they see um, students and science. And so this idea of a pedagogical vision and so things I've noticed about really powerful educators in the past that I've had the opportunity to um, you know, observe for my research is, is this idea that they're really, they, they really have like their goals for teaching science and what they want their students to do with science really matter. Um, and so I think about how that informs then the pedagogy and instruction uh, and the experiences that we create and then how does that shape identities. And so again, pulling off of Nayel and Asur, um, Michael Cole's idea of ideal artifacts, which I'm not gonna go into, and then Chris Gutierrez's idea of pedagogical imagination. So how do really encouraging educators to approach things with this new pedagogical imagination um, that really supports students as social dreamers and designers of their futures. Uh, next slide. So some of the big takeaways from, from my dissertation work with students has been um, that they're, when students have the opportunity to engage meaningfully in science practices. So in this, some of these pictures, they're, these students are taking air quality data on a um, transit line. Uh, and then this map is, is the air quality measurements and, and they're in, engaging in, in community-based science and really came up with some powerful research, um, findings from their research. Um, so really supporting them as learners and doers and change agents in science. Um, that their ideas about what science is and who can do science shift together through engaging in science practices. And then that students, that when we provide instructional pedagogical resources that supports their science and racial identities, this generates new possibilities for youth of color in science. So again, this idea that students are bringing all of who, of who they are into science spaces. And we often you know, talk a lot about in science, a lot of conversations are about what is you know, the more deficit views of what are students lacking, but what are they bringing and how do we actually leverage all of that is a big, a big goal of what I do with my teachers. Um, next slide. And so I really think of my approach for teaching kind of in these three main areas of learning and identity construction, which I've just talked about, um, really helping teachers develop a, a critical pedagogical vision, as I've also talked about, and racial literacy, um, and, and continuing to expand my own, um, and also transforming how they see students of color and science. Again, there's a real strong, I would say a lot of teachers come in with a pretty, either strong and or unaware of a deficit lens that they have about students of color. Um, and also they've learned science in a particular way. And there's now the next generation science standards, which is teaching science in a different, totally different way than they learned. And so science isn't static and facts anymore. It is now engaging in practices. And so I see that as a really big opportunity. Uh, and then how do we design learning environments that, that recognize and value diverse forms of brilliance and leverage diverse and cultural and sense making repertoires. And so we talk a lot about these things in my in my classroom. All right, next slide. I feel like I'm how much where am I on time? Sorry, I should anyone <laughs> anyone if you take about a minute or two to finish up, then we can have about five Maybe minutes for com excellent. Uh, conversation. Okay, we're gonna so I like to really dive into like really intersectional science centered, justice centered science issues. Um and um this is my current fascination, as Luis and maybe others know, with urban heat islands, but it's this really robust scientific idea. There's all kinds of, you can engage in physics or chemistry or biology, but it also really brings in history and redlining and practices that need to be interrogated. Um, and so these are the kinds of things we do is like, how do we engage students in NGSS, in science and engineering practices around these big robust issues or bio biology issues of ethics, uh, next slide. So I was going to give you an example of the research I've been doing. I'm just going to sum it up and say uh, I did a little bit of a study. It's still really emerging, so I can present on this some other time when it's less emerging. Uh, next slide. But uh, next slide. <laughs> So some of the things are, you know, a lot of times I did surveys, interviews, and, and uh, looked at different artifacts. Um, student Teacher candidates often are like, oh, teaching science, I hear this all the time, 
thinking about, oh, I thought we were just going to learn about teaching science, but we spent like half the class talking about science and teaching science to young people because we're teaching science to people. And it really is this really empowering sort of moment for them. And then I feel like they actually, they're like, oh, like this is what science teaching is and are actually way more excited about it. So I'm like, maybe we're not selling this, this thing right. Uh, next slide. And then I have them, some of the things that I have them do are a teaching statement of philosophy of equity. This is someone articulating what they've learned. And so I have them write a draft at the beginning and then revise it at the end. And it's usually like, even though it's been a semester, a fairly transformative um, experience for them. And then last slide or next slide. And then I'm not gonna go to the design principles. I've talked about this a lot with colleagues, but I really actually think this is a useful tool and my, and my teacher candidates say it's a useful tool to really have them synthesize the course readings into these actionable guidelines for future instructional design. And so see, these are some of the themes that commonly emerge. And then last slide, I think this is the last slide. Uh, so takeaways, teacher candidates needs opportunities to engage um, in their own biases and beliefs about science and students. Um, they definitely learn strategies and approaches, approaches for teaching science for equity and justice. And I really, I think the framing and um, the positioning of them as designers is a critical key, a, a critical part of that. Um, and as Dr. Rich Milner uh, recently said, we, we just need to be talking about race. Um, we need to be talking about it in teacher preparation. We need to talk about it as it relates to our disciplines in general. Um, because those are the that's that's when we start interrogating you know the power and positioning. Uh, last slide. I'm going to end with this quote. So I don't know if anyone got to see Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings. Um, she spoke at the Ryle Conference at Stanford last week, and and so she used this quote, and I was like, that is such a great quote. So full credit goes to Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings, and then she continued to inspire us uh, from there, of course, with how we can transform learning environments. But I think this is a really, really, like really kind of encapsulates this moment and where where we should really be, where we can go as a, as, a, as a community. So historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one, what is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us, or we can walk through it lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to put all that pressure on. Oh, no, I, yeah. I, <laughs> There's so much to share like there. Five minute, whatever, and ran right over that, so sorry. So um, I would like to, uh, remind folks that if you'd like to ask a question, you can actually just raise your hand uh, through the web webinar feature and Brian can take you off of mic so we don't have to entirely do this. And yeah, I see that Marisol has her hand raised. Brian, you wanna take her off mute? Uh, hand was raised and then went back down. So I don't know if there's an actual question or if it's just testing out the feature. Okay, um, so while we allow people to just sit with those thoughts for a moment, I would love to hear, you know, having taught uh, across, you know, across the hall from you um, for so many semesters now, Tammy, uh, we teach the same students often. I really am impressed by uh, the design principles that you have them thinking about. And I really love this idea of, um, you know, I think oftentimes in the subject areas in secondary education, folks figure, you know, make this claim that you know we have to teach the content we have no time to add more things into the curriculum and what you've been arguing is that it's not a, a matter of shoehorning more things in it's rethinking what it is that we do and i was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that what does it look like to, to rethink and maybe bringing in some of the design principles you've been talking about like what is it for for the teachers to rethink yeah i mean i think the biggest thing to me is and i try to pull in a lot of and I didn't do like with the design principles, I should really show, but I think it's really important for, for teacher candidates to read things that from authors that they may have not written. So my syllabus is 
almost majority, I would say, you know, scholars of color or educators of color. And I think it's really, and so there's a lot of, I bring TED Talks in, it's kind of a running joke in my class. Um, but I bring in a ton of TED Talks where they're watching Clint Smith and Chris Emden and Nayla Nasir and um, Melissa Crum and all, you know, all of these. And so I think, especially if it's not their lived experience, kind of really, I think you can't imagine unless you're inspired to reimagine by people mm-hmm. who have those visions, right? And so I try to pull in those visionaries, you know, people who are saying we need to reimagine this thing and this is how I think about it. And so, you know, or De- you know, Beverly Daniel Tatum and they all actually, I rely on a lot of their design principles, Joe Bowler, they all have these, like these are practices of equity. Um, so anyway, that kind of, I don't know if that answers the question, but I think, and that's, you know, how I learned too, to, to start to reimagine. And then, you know, I have conversations with like Luis who brought something up about, I've really been reimagining this. I'm like, oh, I'm not like reimagining, you're reimagining, right? And so I think it's like constantly bringing in different perspectives that they may not have encountered. Yeah, yeah. And creating that dialogue. So that we yeah. can inspire, inspire yeah. one another. So I'm seeing lots of comments in the chat. Appreciation. Yeah, and one thing too, I wanted to just add to that because unless someone has a comment, but you know, this summer, like we brought, I brought in a quote from the Atlantic article that I've talked about a lot, or someone shared the and how to be an, or what do anti-racist teachers do differently? It was the principal from Mission High School. She wrote this article and there's a thing about there about looking at how do we how do we change our instruction instead of assuming it's students right who are and I think that's another really big part of the reimagining is like if we like shift the lens from what are these students lacking and like projecting our like pedagogical shortcomings onto them yeah. like what does that actually mean about what I'm like what what am I, what do I need to improve, right? And I think that can really, we've had, we had really interesting discussions this summer over like, you know, like the, the narratives that come up, motivation, what do we do about students that aren't motivated, right? And I'm like, well, let's unpack that narrative, right? And so what is, what is motivation, right? And then it evolved into this, but it also was a really diverse group of teachers. And that really helped to like, be like, well, what about these students that don't feel, they've been told they don't, are good at sight, you know? And so anyway, creating yeah. space for it, I think is just the key. Yeah, and, and, and making teachers realize that students are the curriculum, that, the, that they're not besides the, you know, so it's not something you subject to students, that they are actually the curriculum. Yeah, yeah. Appreciate that. So there's a lots of comments and actually lots of links in the chat. I encourage folks to follow these links. We've got lots of resources here. And um, if you have any other questions, please do drop them in the chat. We'll try to spend a little time at the end if we can, um, redressing those. Uh, but with that, I'd love to give a round of applause for Tammy Visentiner and another round of applause welcoming uh, Luis Posa, uh, Assistant Professor of Teacher Education. Luis. Thank you all. These are uh, tough acts to follow. Um, but uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. I, I really honor the fact that you signed up for a voluntary Zoom meeting. Um, so uh, just thank you again for your time and presence. Um, and thanks also to Dean Latimer and Mark and Brian for organizing the symposium series um, and making it possible. So today I'll be sharing an overview of my recent scholarship. Um, but I'd like to begin by calling your attention to two images. Next slide, please. So, and uh, next image, thank you. Um, both of these are examined in recent work I completed with colleagues Manuel Espinosa, Shirin Bosuji, and Mike Rose. And I wanna acknowledge their leadership on this project, particularly Dr. Espinosa's archival research and his facilitation of the Right to Learn Research Collective that guided and enriched this particular article. So uh, first we have an image from the Supreme Court record for the case of McLaurin v. Oklahoma State Regents for Higher Education. George McLaurin pictured sitting here just outside the classroom was reluctantly admitted to the teacher training program at the University of Oklahoma after an earlier opinion in 1948 had forced the university to desegregate. Relegated to an anteroom, George McLaurin was part of the class but always removed from the life of the classroom, leading the court to hold that quote, such restrictions impair and inhibit his ability to study, 
to engage in discussions and exchange views with other students, and in general, to learn his profession, end quote. Um, next, please. Right. Now, on the right, we have an image from a citizenship education class. Uh, There's a picture taken in 1959 in Johns Island, South Carolina. In the center, we have Septima Clark, educator and activist who worked with the Highlander Folk School in Tennessee, and in sessions like this one, teaching adult literacy and voting rights throughout the South. Without hearing their words, we can rely on their hands and eyes as indicia of the caring, intellectual exertion, and commitment of all present, despite the risks. Juxtaposing the images, we can derive the substantive difference that meaningful participation in one's education makes to the educational experience. The important distinction between being simply seen, being allowed in a space, and as human rights scholars Todras and Higginbotham say of participation rights, being, quote, seen and heard. My scholarship examines the experiences of students learning English in schools, bureaucratically referred to as English learners, but I'll use the terms emergent bilinguals and racialized bilinguals to both highlight the linguistic assets they bring to classrooms and the ways in which their linguistic identities are marginalized by their association with racial hierarchies in the US. In the context I study, obviously, uh, we're well past the era of de jure segregation, and the battle to be seen has been won. Next slide, please. So just to highlight a few of these landmark victories, we can consider the Bilingual Education Act of 1968. Next, please. That allocated funding for programming and research to address the specific needs of emergent bilinguals. The Supreme Court opinion in Lau v. Nichols of 1974, which held that districts must take affirmative steps to make curriculum accessible for students learning English. And next, and Castaneda v. Picard, a 1983 Fifth Circuit holding establishing threefold criteria for program serving emergent bilinguals to ensure minimal thresholds of program quality. So these legal and political victories precluded emergent bilinguals from being ignored or cast off into special education pathways simply because of their language. But these victories were won by framing racialized bilinguals and their linguistic repertoires through a deficit lens, as you see from these excerpts. Their language cast as a deficiency to be remedied, leading to decisions about the quote unquote appropriateness of programming that was agnostic as to whether or not curriculum should be linguistically or culturally responsive and sustaining. Next slide, please. So the result is a well-documented tracking of emergent bilingual students into less rigorous, less engaging coursework, often at the expense of college readiness and eligibility, and especially with regard to English language development, where students receive routinized language as subject instruction in what Guadalupe Valdez calls the ESL ghetto. Next slide, please. This is something I noticed in my own teaching and continue to see in my research. Testing and language arts curricula and the beliefs about language and language learning that underlie them consistently message to students, even to those who've always spoken English, that they are English learners, and often that their Spanish isn't good enough either, despite the myriad functions and relationships that they sustain in their lives through these bilingual repertoires. Next slide, please. So my research consists of two major tracks united by a shared vision. I examine how language ideologies, the beliefs and attitudes about language, the people who use languages, and language learning are embedded in educational policy as well as in educational interactions, and how these shape the schooling experiences of emergent bilinguals. What I seek in this work are frameworks for policy that aspires to more than quote unquote appropriate minimal thresholds driven only by English acquisition, and for classroom ecologies that allow students to be fully seen and heard to be agents in their learning and in their communities. And to accomplish this, I draw from two principal frameworks. Next slide, please. So translanguaging perspectives see language not as an object, but as a social practice, right? Translanguaging posits that multilingual and multidialectal students possess a single linguistic repertoire with all their communicative features, as opposed to prior conceptualizations that imagined each language as a separate set of component words and grammars, um, that could complement each other, but also interfere with one another. So from this singular repertoire, multilinguals strategically assemble utterances as they negotiate identity, meaning, and audience in any given interaction. And in this way, translanguaging is also generative. Next slide, please. Now, uh, translanguaging also explicitly challenges paradigms of standardized language and the racist, classist, and colonialist origins of the standard language myth. Uh, it rejects deficit perspectives about racialized bilinguals and their languaging practices. Next slide, please. 
translanguaging pedagogies as described by Ophelia Garcia and colleagues take these perspectives um, and apply them into teaching practice that supports emergent bilingual students holistically in their learning and in their development within multilingual and multicultural realities. Next slide, please. So the second important framework I draw from uh, these days is that of educational dignity. Now, dignity has been amply theorized and applied in philosophy and law, um, but while it's often invoked in educational research, it's been scarcely defined and often left beyond the scope of any empirical framework for observation or analysis. So in current work, I'm examining the way that dignity has been operationalized across civil rights jurisprudence in the US, um, as well as some secondary literature to understand the central role that the concept of dignity plays in US rights frameworks, even if it's an unnamed value in the constitution itself. Um, legal scholar Walter Murphy, for instance, analyzing constitutional values concludes, quote, that the fundamental value in the American polity has become the dignity of each human being, end quote. And similarly, Lindgren examining discourses in healthcare jurisprudence related to aid in dying and reproductive rights cast dignity as a foundational principle guiding other rights. Next slide, please. In the context of education, Espinosa and Busuji conceive of learning as a rights generative activity because of its humanizing potential and its elevation of the learner to a more meaningful participant in social life, unfit for subordination. Building from this beginning, Espinosa, Busuji, Rose, and I position dignity as inherent in, the per in personhood, however, socially contingent for its recognition and affirmation thus opening the door for an anthropological method by which to empirically examine educational activity through a dignity lens. We define educational dignity as, quote, the multifaceted sense of a person's value generated via substantive intra and interpersonal educational experiences that recognize and cultivate one's mind, humanity, and creative potential. We establish criteria, simultaneous first, second, and third person perspectives that could experience or observe educational interactions to bring dignity from the ethereal to the concrete. Next slide, please. Uh, and one more, please. Now, to further support this effort of making the sense of one's dignity tangible, let me return to the work we're reviewing jurisprudence in which dignity is named as a basis for civil rights holding, um, and the work I'm doing there to distill the fundamental elements of dignity. So in several opinions, such as Miranda v. Arizona or Chop v. Dulles, these are both cases having to do with criminal procedure and punishment, dignity is cast as what Aron Barak calls a mother right, um, or a right from which other freedoms and protections emerge. It's what Lucian Pop calls, quote, the right to have rights. Now, in other aspects of the law, next please. Uh, most notably, law dealing with access for people with disabilities, LGBTQ rights, um, healthcare, including reproductive rights, Dignity is specifically named in protections against infringement upon individuals' autonomy and decision-making, their social equality or equality of status, and their ability to be meaningful participants in aspects of civil and social life. Now, while dignity is not specifically named in the landmark opinions for emergent bilinguals or national origin minorities that I've listed here um, as examples, I identify areas in these holdings where these same freedoms are guaranteed or protected. By doing this, I argue that the groundwork is already there for our policy and our practice to aspire to more than appropriateness and remediation with a myopic fixation on language rather than the people who do the languaging. Next slide, please. So let me quickly share an example of this anthropological method applied and drawing on these elements of legal dignity to analyze educational activity. Uh, this example comes from a chapter now in press co-authored with the inspiring teacher who led the classroom I'm about to describe. Uh, this project was generally supported by the National Academy of Education, the Spencer Foundation, uh, and it investigated the experiences of students, families, and educators in a bilingual K-8 school amid rapid gentrification of its surrounding community. We sought to understand how to continue to foreground equity, cultural responsiveness, and political consciousness in a school and neighborhood that had been a hub of civil rights organizing during the Chicano power movement, despite the increasing presence of white, affluent, English monolingual students and families. Next slide, please. So I undertook this inquiry with ethnographic participant observation in teaching and several school committees, as well as a Denver Public Schools Task Force on Gentrification and Integration, um, along with semi-structured interviews, artifact analysis, um, and as you'll see, some youth participatory action research with students at the school. Uh, and I approach these various modes of data collection through the perspective of social design experiments, which bring together principles from design research and cultural historical activity theory. 
Um, Chris Gutierrez offers that social design experiments, quote, seek to transform social institutions and their practices through mutual relations of exchange with constituent people as valued stakeholders and partners. And this approach uses mixed methods, but privileges multi-sided ethnography to develop a historicized understanding of the ecology, its resources, and constraints. And Gutierrez and Bosuki elaborate by stating, quote, that this interventionist research maintains that change in the individual involves change in the social situation itself. Next slide, please. So interventions resulting from observed needs and emerging questions resist pathologizing groups or individuals for perceived skill deficits and are instead framed as re-hyphen mediations, a lens that consider, considers socio-historical context shaping students' experiences and calls for, quote, a reorganization of the entire ecology of learning. So after extensive observation, interviews, and discussion in the for, first portion of the study, one area in need of such re-hyphen mediation was the heavy reliance on teacher-centered instruction and the siloing of language and literacy development into ESL or academic Spanish pathways. To help chart a different course, I partnered with a middle school social studies teacher already engaged in a number of culturally sustaining practices with his students and eager to collaborate. Next slide, please. In a social studies unit on westward expansion, the teacher avoided the banality of drilling key vocabulary and extracting main ideas from textbook with attention to features of expository writing. Rather, students consulted primary sources, such as a speech to Congress by Andrew Jackson, an interview by Sitting Bull, letters and journal entries from pioneers, missionaries, gold prospectors, and Chinese immigrants. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide as well. They compared artwork representing different perspectives. So we see John Gass, American Progress, and the video installation by John J. Alanios entitled Destiny's Manifest. Next slide. Um, they coupled these sources with the study of maps, tables, and images of how land ownership and use changed over time. They composed essays comparing and contrasting European American perspectives to Native American perspectives and the different experiences of the various groups going west or being displaced and slaughtered. Uh, next slide, please. Now, at the same time, since students made the connection to the gentrification that was dramatically affecting the school community in their own lives, the teacher supported them in researching gentrification through news articles and social media, through interviews with parents, community residents, uh, city and school district officials, construction workers, um, as well as their peers and sharing their own stories of displacement and housing insecurity. Next slide. And the next slide as well, please. And one more. They composed multimedia projects, slideshows, animations, posters, and videos to complement meticulously drafted and revised essays comparing and contrasting gentrification and westward expansion, weighing benefits and liabilities according to the diverse perspectives they encountered in their research, both in English and in Spanish, according to how best they could access information and express themselves despite monolingual English expectations within the curriculum. Uh, next slide. The students shared their findings with the same public officials who were gracious enough to be interviewed, uh, and next slide as well, uh, and with peers in other classrooms, generating suggestions for how families could both resist displacement um, and how new and old community members could better get along. What resulted in short was a unit of study in which students' voices, experiences, concerns, and skills were brought to bear alongside the learning of academic skills and in service of a more integrated, equitable, and small d democratic community. Next slide, please. Thus, this classroom fostered what Chris Gutierrez calls socio-critical literacies, where students see themselves as historical actors and quote, the curriculum and its pedagogy are grounded in the historical and current particulars of students' everyday lives, while at the same time oriented toward an imagined but possible future. In so doing, the class provides an example of students as meaningful participants in their learning and the life of the community, as social equals to the adults of whom they ask questions um, and to whom they make suggestions, and as agentive decision makers in their communicative and academic choices. Their first person accounts confirm this, and as a second person participant observer, I too would regard this unit as substantive inter and intrapersonal activity, nurturing creativity and potential. I leave to you all to be the third person arbiters, but I offer this as the promise of an educational dignity paradigm for the schooling of emergent bilinguals. Thank you. Uh, next slide. And thank you, Luis. Round of applause. Just imagine the applause happening. <laughs> uh, once again, if you have a question that you'd like to pose, feel free to raise your hand or drop it into the chat. 
And um, we can either take you off mic or I can read your question. Uh, in the meantime, maybe I'll start off again, Luis. And one thing I find very interesting here is a, is a clear connection between your presentation and Tammy's presentation, wherein in both cases, you talk about situating students at the center of, of inquiry, where um, they are a conduit for information, right? Um, they, are, they are knowers, A, but B, they're also discoverers in some way. And I was just curious, um, how do you see kind of the repositioning of students as, as knowers and inquirers in the new standards uh, in relation to this point that you're making about um, translanguaging pedagogies? Do you, is it fundamental to creating space for translanguaging pedagogies? Or is there something more that we should be bringing into the standards or to the curriculum to make more space for translanguaging pedagogies? Um, what are your thoughts there? Yeah. Um... So I, I think in part, it depends on which standards you're, you're talking about, right? So if you're talking about simply Common Core, right, I think there, there is a flexibility within the Common Core standards for students to um, adopt, trans, for teachers to adopt translanguaging pedagogical lens, right, to, to bring in students familiar language practices. Um, the folks at the City University of New York, uh, New York State Initiative on Emergent Bilinguals have whole uh, practitioner uh, guidebooks that include common core aligned lesson plans and things like that with translingual frameworks, right? And uh, I know the International High Schools Network, uh, mainly in New York, but there's, there's another one in, in Oakland as well, right? They also draw really heavily. So these are high schools that serve uh, newcomer students, right? Whole, whole population, uh, their whole student population is newcomers. Uh, many of them immigrant and refugee students with interrupted formal schooling and things like that. And they have organized their whole curriculum around translanguaging frameworks. And obviously it is also common core aligned in its own ways. Um, that, that said, right, um, I think, uh, and, and this is especially true of language proficiency standards, right, and English language development standards, right? That's where we start to get much more um, what Ophelia Garcia calls monoglossic approaches. So this idea of the having a, a monolingual paradigm and, and the standardized language paradigm of language, um, as well as a notion of language learning that is, it is sort of the linear piecemeal acquisition of components pieces until some native-like stage of proficiency, um, as opposed to that much more sort of sociocultural um, orientation to language and, and language learning, right? So, so I think in the language proficiency standards, um, and then obviously this uh, ripples out into language testing, um, the linguistic classification of students, right? Um, those are much more constrictive of, of translanguaging pedagogies, right? Um, now, I, you know, again, right, uh, the, a, a translanguaging pedagogy, as you said, right, does center not only the student as, as, as a knower and as a discoverer of, of knowledge, but it, it, can, it also includes the student as a, a generator of linguistic innovation and, and linguistic dexterity in, in that way too. Right? Um, it's honoring and tapping into that that rich linguistic knowledge that they have present, rather than saying that there's something absent in their linguistic awareness or knowledge. Right. Right. Well, and, and letting them be agents in the ways that language itself evolves, right? And, mm -hmm. As opposed to language is something they have to acquire. Language is something that they, through their own use. Um, of language in the community and, and things like that is also something that they can influence. Thank so you. I noticed that uh, Rebecca asked a question in the in the chat. So she is asking um, how to distinguish uh, dignity from from caring or other socio emotional frameworks. And um, you know, uh, I, and certainly there's an alignment uh, to some extent, right? So so dignity does. Um, you know, really emphasize this notion of, of inherent personhood and, and honoring the subjectivity of, of everyone in the class. Um, and, and I think this is why I'm really interested in, in distilling it um, into its legal roots, right, and looking at the ways that dignity is specifically operationalized in civil rights jurisprudence, right, to see, you know, what, what are these specific freedoms and protections that, that dignity is linked with, right? So, um, you know, and, and so by identifying these specific things, meaningful participation, social equality, um, uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> blanking now. Uh, but so I, identifying the, those three central elements, um, 
right? We, we have a framework, not just for how we look at students and how we treat students, but for the kinds of curricular arrangements we need to establish. Um, and, and so it is uh, not only attending to, to students' socio-emotional health, right? But in ensuring that they have agency in their own learning um, and in the factors that, that shape that socio-emotional health as well. See Mark give wait time to see if there are any further questions from the group. And if there aren't, I just want to thank everyone for uh, coming and, and taking time out of their Thursday afternoon to listen to our three speakers. I want to thank the three speakers, uh, Siley, Tammy, and Luis, for some incredible ideas. It's, you know, uh, I, I learned from you through our students many times. Uh, by talking with our students, but hearing directly from you and, um, and, and just the richness of the ideas that you're bringing excite me. Um, and um, hopefully they've excited our, our participants today. Uh, I encourage you all to reach out to Luis, Tammy, and to Zyli. Uh, if you see potential connections in the work that you're doing, if you see ways in which you can build out your thinking about your own research um, in, in the directions um, that, that three of our presenters today are taking, um, you know, our real goal here uh, in, in, in sharing our research is to really better understand the work that we do through the multiple lenses that we as faculty are taking uh, to education. And I really appreciate the, the unity of, of, of perspectives, actually, as I'm speaking of diversity of perspective, but the, universe, the unity of perspectives that were coming through the three speakers today. So um, thank you all for attending today. I just want to spend a moment to pitch our next um, faculty symposium speakers, uh, Eduardo Munoz Munoz and Rebecca Bersiaga. Uh, we're looking forward to their talks on November 12th. I also wanna pitch another event. So on November 12th, before uh, our, our symposium speaker series from two to three o'clock, we're gonna be visited by uh, Panos uh, Vagenas. He is our research development specialist who is assigned to the College of Education. He's gonna be talking about uh, the grant search process, about uh, building projects uh, and, and presenting projects in ways that um, connect with um, funding that's available. And he'll be talking a little bit about the resources that he can bring and the support that he can provide for faculty that are looking for external funding for their research. So I encourage you all to come join us from two to three o'clock on November, Thursday, November 12th for a, a, a meeting with, uh, with Panos Vagenas and also to come from three to four o'clock for um, our speaker series with Eduardo Munoz Munoz and Rebecca Borsiaga. Again, thank you all for attending today. Thank you speakers for coming today and sharing your research. Uh, we look forward to hearing more. Take care folks. <laughs>